Welcome back to another UNC Basketball Recruiting Podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated, don't forget to hit the notification bell. You get updates every time we upload a video. We do a ton, basketball recruiting, football recruiting, and a lot of stuff about the actual football and basketball Tar Heels. And as we get closer to a football season that may or may not happen, we still have a lot of interviews with Mac Brown. And so far, 21 players this month. David Sisk is our basketball recruiting analyst. And David, the class of 2021 already has a commit from Dontre Styles. We know they're going to have at least three commits in this class and perhaps more. A lot of that will be determined on how things play out this season. So we're going to discuss four kids who are on UNC's radar. Caleb Houston, uh, Hunter Salas, Trey Kaufman, and DeMarco Dunn. Let's go ahead and start um, with Caleb Houston, a kid who actually was 2022 when UNC offered him, he reclassified a couple of months ago. So I know you had some inside information. You talked to the preeminent basketball rec- uh, uh, scout and analyst in, in Canada here a couple of days ago. So what's the latest with Caleb Houston? Elias Sabit, uh, North Pole Hoops, like you say. He's been a, a friend of mine for a good while, really helpful, and he knows he knows all these kids in Canada and what's going on. And he uh, – you know, really mentioned North Carolina a lot with them. And I know uh, Corey Evans really got my attention a few days back uh, when we spoke with him and he did an interview with us on the Carolina recruiting class. And he thinks North Carolina has has really got a good shot there. And, uh, you know, they got in, offered him in April. That was before he reclassified in June. So, uh, you know, they've been there. Roy has – been able to build relationships as he's been able to do a lot of these kids. And, uh, you know, North Carolina's that name. It's that blue blood school. He definitely knows who North Carolina is. He knows about their tradition. He knows about the quality of the program. So, yeah, he's a guy that that, uh, one of the four, like you say, that I would really watch uh, in this 2021 class as far as North Carolina is concerned. Carolina offered him in April. He reclassified, I think, sometime in late June. Yes. Uh, how much does it help that Carolina was in there when he was 22, kid, knowing that they were going to have to invest a year and a half in that recruitment, and they were ready to do that? I, I think it's maybe bigger now than it's been in the past because you can't swoop in as a program and a player uh, – comes into your campus by dark of night on the visit, and the next thing you know, you signed him. Uh, it's a situation now where everything is Zoom calls, it's virtual visits, it's text, it's phone calls, it's a meeting with a family, it's meeting with the high school coaches, the trainer, you name it. It's about building relationships. Roy's as good as that as anybody is. And I think to build a relationship, I think, whoever has been doing that the longest, if they're good at it and Roy's good at it, they have the advantage. I just think it's hard to come in, like I say, and offer somebody five, six months, a year later than North Carolina and then come in and, and try to do some damage. So I really, I really think they laid the groundwork early. And, and I think, yes, that is an advantage. Six foot eight likes to play outside how does how would he fit into the way Carolina plays six eight um really as versatility more of a slash two three you think six eight would he be a a a forward power forward but no he's a a two three Uh, Elias really compares him to Jason Tatum and like I said I know that's not a comparison that North Carolina fans like but even the most diehard North Carolina fan, Duke Cater, would say, yeah, I'd like to have Jason Tatum on my team. So, you know, that length, that size, the skill set to play a shooting guard as 6'8", those are rare. You start looking at the Tatums and the Tracy McGrady's and individuals like that, and uh, those are the ones, to me, who have the higher ceiling. Those are the ones that get ranked higher, and those are the ones that have the longest NBA shelf life. I mean, he's, uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, an NBA prospect type player and, and, and most likely a first-round pick. How refined are his ball skills? You said kind of a 2-3, so he's got to have some ball, a lot of ball skills out there. Where, where is he in that, in that sense? Yeah, and, and that's the thing, too. And, and 
I think at that age, uh, at that length, that it's a work in progress a little bit. I've said this. I think the, the bigger you are, the taller you are, it just takes longer. Uh, I can't explain why, but I really, I think it's more of a work in progress. You know, when I remember seeing Jason Tatum, uh, his 17 and under season with Bradley Bill Elite uh, in, I guess, playing in May. And he looked uh, totally different than he does now. I mean, his frame was kind of alike, but the game and skill sets were totally different. So it's something that develops. I think because I, I, I could see him be when he was younger, probably playing in the post. And and I'm sure if he was taller and bigger than the other guys, he's in middle school. He's probably not playing yeah. point guard. He's not doing that at a young age. So it's something that he's had to grow into, like the others. I'm sure. Well, there's a chance that UNC may need, UNC may need multiple bigs in the class of 21. So we go over to Trey Kaufman, who's about the same height as Caleb Houston, but it's more of a lower block guy. So tell everybody. Uh, a little bit about Trey Kaufman's game, and then we'll kind of get your feeling on the pulse of that as well. Trey is is a, more of a four, power forward, and that's something that's going to be very important, I, I think, because I know talking with Corey uh, last week in, in our interview with him at Tar Heel Illustrated, we asked him, um, or I asked him, what uh, do you see as their biggest need? He said they need an extra ball handler. They need somebody in the post. But the post was the biggest need because they're – is the chance uh, it's, it's a very deep inside game roster next year for North Carolina, but there's a chance that all those guys could be gone and they're going to need somebody out of his class uh, to step in at the post position. And right now, Trey uh, is really, I, I think their best, their best chance. I'm not going to say best option, but best chance to land somebody. And so he becomes very important. Uh, you hear uh, Indiana, Purdue, Louisville, uh, those three schools right there are local. I consider Louisville, they're right there on Ohio River uh, to be in southern Indiana. Um, so, and then you've got Virginia pushing, but uh, I think the best chances of him leaving the state are North Carolina. And it is North Carolina, and I do think it'll come down between Indiana and North Carolina. But I think more and more, just speaking with, with and just reading what Corey and, and Eric Bossy say, they think every time I read them, it, it looks like they feel like there's more of a chance that he could leave the state and leave the region. And when I interviewed him two through two weeks ago, uh, you know, he doesn't hide it. He says, "Whatever's the best opportunity for me." I'm going to take it. I don't have to stay in Indiana. So, yeah, he, he's a guy that, yeah, I would, I would put up at the very top of the list to watch for Tar Heel fans. Well, I wanted to ask the Pulse about he and Houston together simply because if you – there's a thread on our board, so people are kind of debating, you know, one 6'8 versus another 6'8. But they can absolutely coincide on the court together at the same time. They, like you said, one's a four, one's a two, three. So the odds of them landing both of those guys – and maybe at 6'8", Trey Kaufman's not a huge lower block player, but then you have a huge wing player, a 6'8 guy in Houston. Do you see that, them kind of working out well together if they both were to choose Carolina? Yeah, there's no, um, there's no clash right there of styles. Uh, and there's no battle for position. Like I said, um, Caleb Houston's a, a two-slash-three, whereas I look at Kaufman more as a four. Uh, and even if he could step out at that three, he's more of the three, four. Um, I think when, when you look when they're drafted or their draft day comes around, I think you're going to see Caleb Houston with a much higher ceiling uh, and a higher number because the NBA wants those bigger guards. If you look at the NBA now, man, it's not like – you remember Magic Johnson came on in 1980, a six nine point guard. Nobody would ever seen anything mm-hmm. like it. And it changed the game. But now there's Magic Johnsons all over the floor. I mean, uh, every guard out there is like 6'6", oh, 6'7", six, 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 almost, it seems. So he fits into that NBA mode as a guard. I mean, I, I know traditionally I used to think 6'8", that's a post player. Now we think maybe 6'8", might be a small forward. But, but man, 6'8", can be a shooting guard, too. We see it throughout the league. So he just because he's, he's that height – 
that doesn't mean that that they're that there's not a chance that he could coexist with, with Kaufman. I don't see a problem whatsoever. UNC might also have a need at the point. I think there are some people that think that Caleb Love might be the most likely of the of the current freshmen that would go pro. But I think that you know, as you were alluding to earlier, some of those bigs could leave as well. Now, if Caleb Love doesn't go pro and comes back, or it looks like he's going to be coming back. Would that affect what Hunter Salas does? Or does Hunter Salas maybe look at that and say, hey, we can coexist. A lot of guys don't really like being called just point guards now. They want to be called combo guards. And two combo guards on the floor at the same time certainly can work out well. I know that Roy has more and more wanted combo guards because he wants plenty of, of, of a, safe, much, a huge safety net behind the point guard situation just in case. And Roy also likes two or three ball handlers out on the floor at the same time, too. So, uh, But, you know, when I look at North Carolina, we talked about numbers and that there might be a a drought of numbers in 21-22 in the post for North Carolina, but the opposite could be true on the perimeter. I mean, North Carolina could be stacked in in quality and quantity on the perimeter. So the question is, is – that's something that Hunter Salas would be uh, intimidated by, or maybe not the words intimidated, but would he feel like that's the best option and the best fit? Now, depending on who you talk to, maybe not about Salas, but just players, uh, guys who are top 10, top 15, top 20 players, they're, they're different, man. I mean, they're alphas. So I don't think there's a player on that top 10, top 15 list that believes that if he went to any school in the country, nobody, no matter who's there, he couldn't beat them out. I just don't think there's anybody like that. And if there is somebody like that on that list, you don't want them on your team. No. So I, 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 th- I don't see where that's a problem. Now, a player can look at fit. Uh, I've had other kids tell me on that list, you know, what about making the decision? A lot of them who are more elite players want to look at the spring. They don't have to be rushed. You know, any program will take them at any time. And they tell me, hey, we're going to see what the roster looks like. You know, uh, what's, who's there? Who's go, coming? Who's leaving? What the strengths are? What the weaknesses are? So I think they look a little bit both, both ways. I think Hunter Salas would look at this and say, hey, I'm not scared of anybody that's on there, I can beat them out. But I'm also going to take a look at uh, uh, what those positions and what those rosters look like before I make that final decision. Because ultimately, there's going to be one fit that's better for him than any other. He just released his top 12, uh, believe it or not, (laughs) before we take this podcast. And and based on what I'm reading in the situation, I would Wait, say I heard those. I heard this on 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 Trevor Immelman say this. He is on on CBS. He he covers the PGA Tour, and he's the one out on the course covering the group. So before a player hits, he says, "Okay, he's getting ready to go seven iron." And he said, "Well, how can you see that from 40 yards away? Well, the caddy will signal this is seven. Okay, so." It's going to be five two fingers down. So um, instead of going with both hands, so that's uh, that's where the twelve. You know, I don't so have what, three hands. Why do I, I get the impression I do that? Why do I get the impression that's going to be the first of many golf analogies <laughs> that we have in these podcasts? Um, I would say it, it's fair to say maybe half of those twelve schools probably they're there for a variety of reasons, but this is really going to come down to maybe the other somebody from the other six UNC I know you met Creighton uh, Iowa State you've talked about Kansas is in there UK just offered kind of take us through through that right now I think and I'm trying to pull up actually uh, the graphic and it's funny you can barely get all the school emblems on the, the graphic <laughs> page but um Kentucky, Michigan, Oregon, Gonzaga, North Carolina, Auburn, Iowa State, Alabama, Creighton, Kansas, Louisville, UCLA. Okay. Uh, and speaking, Eric Bossy knows his recruitment better than anybody yeah. in, uh, living out in that area. And I've spoken to some other individuals who know it, who are close to the family. 
Um, you know, North Carolina, they think, you know, obviously was probably in the top two or three here, just like they are with Kaufman. So if you look at Kaufman, I would say top two, Indiana, North Carolina. I would say probably top two, three, four uh, for Salas. I think if you really look at the schools, uh, Creighton has been there the longest, and it's in its hometown. And then, you know, Kansas has built a relationship. Uh, I think North Carolina, I had a friend of the family tell me that he thinks if North Carolina, if there's a school to beat out, he believes it's Iowa State because they built a top relationship with him. Uh, Michigan, there's been some talk there. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting. He's cut this list, so now it's going to be interesting to see how long this thing plays out uh, before he, he makes that decision. But North Carolina, obviously, has put themselves right there. You may not be able to answer this question at all, but uh, and I know that an in-person or an on-campus visit would be very important. They're obviously right now the NCAA is not allowing any of that, but there's no rule against a kid hopping on a plane, flying to RDU and getting an Uber or renting a car and driving over, just checking out Chapel, just at least seeing what the town looks like. Is he the kind of kid you think might do something like that? Because a lot of kids in the past have made unofficial visits where it's on their done, it's on their time, and they check stuff out. You won't be able to see Roy, may not be able to get in to see the dean to him, although it used to be able to walk in a lot of times and check things out. Do um, you think he's the kind of kid that might do something like that? Possibly could because he wants to see the campuses, but he's got a very good support system with his family. You know, great family. Um, and here's the thing. They're going to be supportive, but they're going to let him make the decision. And it's a comparison to me, like with Kennedy Chandler and his dad, you know, but – it, it's really weird in, in the way Kennedy was. His dad really enjoyed that recruitment. So, yeah, he was looking forward to another Zoom call with Roy. He really was. He wanted this thing to go. He was enjoying it. Kennedy hated it. So, you know, he wanted just to get it done. And he said so the day before with Brent Hubs of AllQuest in, in a, a video interview with them before he – the day before he made that commitment. He said, I'm, I, I'm going to get it over. Uh, so here's the thing with, with Hunter. It may be a situation there. I, I'm hearing that, you know, he gets really tired of burned out with the recruiting process, you know, and his parents might, you never know, they may want to extend it out more. I think they really like the blue, from what I hear, like the blue blood uh, uh, look, whereas he may be more content to, to go outside of an elite program type. So, um I think it depends a lot to him and how quickly he wants to get this thing done. I think if he wants to let this thing play out, you know, he may wait and see if they can take some kind of visit in the spring. Because it's going to be interesting to me if they're allowed to do it during the season, let's say January, February, or after spring. Because I just think you uh, – things could change. Do they come up with a vaccine? I'm curious to see what happens of all this after the election's over, to be serious. So I, I, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. Uh, one young man who was on, certainly went on the UNC right or the fan base. Our fans didn't, weren't really familiar with him six months ago is DeMarco Dunn. But, you know, UNC started showing a lot of interest and then he exploded. He went from unranked to 77th, and I suspect that the next time Rivals comes out with the rankings, he's going to be much higher than 77. He is, he's from Arizona, but he moved to North Carolina a little over a year ago. His mother got a job in the Fayetteville area, I believe at the base there, and he's now in North Carolina. He played the Garner Road AAU team. When you play the, for the Garner Road AAU team, you're, you're fully ensconced in you know, all things North Carolina. So uh, he just put out a top seven recently and obviously Carolina's on there Arizona Vanderbilt coached by Jerry Stackhouse and of course there's a direct connection to DeMarco's high school coach with the Stackhouse family so where are things right now with DeMarco Dunn and before you answer let me preface by saying a lot of people on our board have just kind of assumed that this kid would pop with the Tar Heels I don't think it's the slam dunk for UNC I think Arizona and Vanderbilt are gonna have a lot to say about that what do you say and and, and after that we'll talk about his game well, he's from Arizona, and most of his family lives in Arizona. So, you know, he's only been in North Carolina for a few months. Now, I think he's been really impressed with how basketball crazy the state is. So I think that's something that, that he enjoys. Um, and obviously, 
if you are in state, whether you're a transplant or whether you've lived here your whole life, there's going to be a lot of pressure, local pressure to stay. I'm sure he hears it dozens of times a day. Hey, man, you got to stay home. Tar Heels, Carolina Blue, you, you know, you, you hear all that. I'm sure he hears all that all the time. Um, Vanderbilt, you talked about that connection. They were, if I'm not mistaken, the first Power Five to offer – yeah. And uh, his head coach at his high school there is George Stackhouse, who's a cousin to Jerry Stackhouse at Vanderbilt, former North Carolina great. Uh, I would say North Carolina is the favorite. Uh, but like you said, I just don't think you can put it in the slam dunk category simply because I think those other teams are uh, going to make a push. Right now I think it's far enough off to where – you don't hear leaks out of there yet. I'm interested to see as this thing goes. Number one, when's he going to do it? And that's the question I ask of all of them. Early signing period's in November, so you're looking about two and a half months away. You know, most of them commit before then. They usually do it September, October. But they're doing that when they don't take official visits also. So you've got official visits. It just you wait and see if more offers come. I think if you live in North Carolina, there's a blue blood right there in your state, and then you're from Arizona. I can't see what else he would wait on unless he wants to hear something from Duke. So, uh, you know, I, I think North Carolina is the favorite right now. Yeah, I would lean that way. But like I said, I, there's no way I'd bet the mortgage on it yet. What if Caleb Houston decides in three weeks he wants to go to North Carolina? Would that affect the DeMarco Dunn situation at all? Could do it. Because you're looking at a shooting guard, and you're also looking at the guard depth. So, yeah, I, I think it does. So, it's almost like there's a game of chicken, too, right there. You know, who commits first? And you see that, you know, in a lot of places. And, and I'll make comparisons to other schools. You'll see uh, uh, a guard, let's say a guard, you know, are, are looking very favorable at a program and somebody else commits there and then they go somewhere else. So, you know, you see that a, a lot of times. So, um, yeah, I do think that that uh, could have or, or would have a direct impact. I really do. So I think that's some of the things you've got to check on, man. Uh, recruiting's fluid. It changes, you know, you, it's like the weather in North Carolina, March and April. If you don't like the way it is now, wait five minutes and it'll change. And I think uh, that's the case there, you know. Mm -hmm. If DeMarco Dunn commits first, what would it do to Caleb Houston? If yeah. Hunter Salas commits first, what's it do to Hunter, to, to uh, uh, the other two? So, yeah, definitely. Before we close this out, what is it about Dunn's game that just pops out that – when you watch him on film, where he went from unranked to 77th, and I'm hearing that the jump that he makes for the next ranking could be 30, 40 spots. Yeah. What is it about his game that just jumps out right now? True spot, true position. I just think he was a guy that flew under the radar, and that happened. So there was another kid out of Arizona when I was covering the Vanderbilt site, and his name was Saban Lee. And Saban um, had three great years. As, as bad as the team was, had three tremendous years at Vanderbilt. And, you know, he was the guy who uh, kind of reminds me of that. Nobody had heard of. So he, he cracked it and, and jumped up pretty high, up to about number 100. Uh, and they had another kid, Aaron Neesmith, who kind of did that. And what happened – they kind of played before on non-shoe-sponsored AAU teams. And they didn't get as much hype, didn't get – and Corey and, and, and Bossy will tell you, sometimes about a kid, they fly under the radar, they'll be honest and say, hey, I've just not got to see him. And uh, we've heard stuff, and we know he's good enough to be here. We just don't know where to put him. And I'm seeing Aaron Neesmith now who – uh, spent a large time of, out of Charleston, South Carolina, who spent a large time of his high school career unranked, uh, could possibly go. I think the newest ESPN uh, mock draft has got him number 10 going wow. in the lottery. And, and he was really good. It was just you didn't get that opportunity. But I think like DeMarco Dunn, what do I like about DeMarco Dunn? He's got a true position. 
okay? I mean, he is a true type shooting guard. I think he's got that true position. He, his athleticism jumps off the page at you. That's very good. He's very skilled at what he does. So I think, and that's one thing, he's not one of these kids like I talked about that you're trying to see, hey, can this guy grow into this position? This 6'9 kid that's played post, that now is trying to prove he can step out on the floor. DeMarco Dunn's not that kid. DeMarco Dunn, man, has his game in check, and you know what you're getting in him, and it's very good. So his ascension right now kind of reminds me of an Aaron Neesmith who, you know, ended up right around in there, 60th, 70th, right or you know uh, was off the radar off the top 150 for a long time jumped up there and got it impressed some people and the next thing you know man he's better than anybody will have ever dreamed and that could be demarco dunn if you're watching this video on our youtube channel when when you're done here scroll down a little bit and you'll see a video an iso video that jacob turner shot down at myrtle beach just about six weeks ago of demarco dunn some really good stuff uh that we were able to get of him David, awesome stuff, my friend, and appreciate the uh, the golf analogy. We're going to have one every show now. You're now on the spot for that. Great yeah. on, my friend. <laughs> and I was going to ask, and we talked about this when we started. I was watching Dustin Johnson come back from the rain delay with a nine-stroke lead, and I asked the question, if they put you or me in his shoes with two holes left to play, could you hold a nine-stroke lead? And not I wouldn't. Uh, tell, them, tell them what you shot. You're only 1,800 you ever played. It's great. When I had a radio show in Wilmington back in 2002, <laughs> I did a stunt for the show, sort of a, a – we had this thing where this, this course down there called Beau Rivage gave away a foursome freebie for the person who could close come closest predicting what my score would be. I'd never picked up a golf club in my life, so I went out and I did 18 holes. I had a golf pro with me kind of coaching me up a little bit, and I shot a 178. But I was a 60 on the back nine, and I didn't lose any balls, so I was very proud of that. And somebody actually picked a 160, and so they got one of those four guys, foursomes of Beau Rivage. So you're one of those guys who flew under the radar for a long time. Yeah, I'm still under the radar. The next thing you know, you're ranked like 50. No, I, you know, I played putt-putt as a kid, if that counts, but it's a little different out there on the actual course. Hey, but I didn't lose any balls. I didn't, I didn't tear up the, the, the surface that much, and I, I learned how to rink the, the, um, the, the sand traps or whatever you guys call those things. I'm not a big, big golf guy. I appreciate it, and I totally recognize how hard it is. And I think that if you were ever around Roy Williams, uh, if you got in one of those little golf things, he would appreciate that because Roy's a huge golf guy. Oh, yeah. All right, for David Sisk, I'm Andrew Jones. You've been watching another UNC basketball recruiting podcast right here at TarHillIllustrate.com. And – Tar Heel Illustrated on our YouTube channel. Go ahead and click like if you like this video. Hit that notification bell so you get updates every time we upload a video, and we do plenty. Thanks for stopping by.